I'm Jeff Hawkins. Uh, I'm going to do a little talk that I gave a few weeks ago at a conference called NASIS. Uh, NASIS was uh, the first, hopefully many, uh, conferences dedicated to the, um, to the concept of how can neuroscience help the future of AI. So what can we learn from brains to uh, influence and help uh, the future of artificial intelligence? So that was the theme of the conference. Um, I gave a, a, a talk at that conference. That talk, uh, although it was recorded, is not available publicly. So we decided uh, to, to re-record the talk, pretty much the same talk. Uh, so if anyone would like to see it, you can do that. The title of my talk was How the Brain Uses Reference Frames to Model the World, Why a a AI Needs to Do the Same. So let's just jump right into it. I'm going to start with this, um, uh, this, this is an article written by Francis Crick a long time ago, 1979, called Thinking About the Brain. And it was very influential for me, and I think for a lot of people, actually. And even back then, in 1979, Francis Crick made the observation that we had this huge amount of data about the brain, tremendous amounts of factual knowledge, but we didn't understand how it worked. The brain was still a big mystery. And he, his basic argument was that we did, probably don't need more data or more discoveries. We need to, what we need is a new way of thinking about the data we already have. So that's in the subtitle, that to understand the brain, we need new ways of thinking about it. And here's a quote that's from further in, it says, what is conspicuously lacking is a framework, a framework of ideas in which to interpret all these different approaches. So I'm gonna to talk today about um, proposing a framework, a new way of thinking about the facts we have about the brain um, to help, uh, we think we're gonna be important for the future of AI. Uh, my company, Numenta, we studied the neocortex. Um, the neocortex is, uh, occupies about 70% of the volume of the human brain. It's a large sheet of tissue, about 1,500 square centimeters, two and a half millimeters thick. Uh, and, and mammals have one, but it's clearly all mammals have one, but you don't need to have a neocortex to have some level of intelligence. A lot of animals have birds and octopuses and so on have levels of intelligence. They don't have a neocortex, but it is clearly the organ of intelligence for humans and for mammals. Um, in, uh, in humans, um, it is it's the organ of intelligence. And so all high level sensory perceptions, whether it's vision, touch or hearing, anything you're consciously aware of or thinking about or, or, or are able to talk about uh, is occurring in the neocortex. So when you look at something and touch something and hear people talking and so on, that's all the neocortex. It is also generates almost all of our high level motor behaviors. So if we move our limbs to manipulate tools or type on a keyboard or learn a new app on your smartphone or to drive a car, for example, that's all happening in the neocortex. And of course, language itself is a motor output. Um, and so that's generated by the neocortex as well. And of course, the neocortex is a, is a home of all abstract thought, whether it's math or science or philosophy. Everything we think about, the higher level thinking and conceptual knowledge that humans have, that's the, that is created by the neocortex. In addition to these remarkable uh, abilities, it has some uh, attributes that are quite different than uh, today's AI. Uh, one is it learns continuously. It never stops learning. Uh, we never stop as long as you're awake as you go about your day you're constantly updating your knowledge of the world you're constantly learning new things it, it learning is part of how the neocortex works it's not a separate phase that you go through it's it goes on for your entire life it learns very rapidly i can walk into a new room and very quickly in a matter of a few seconds learn what's in that room and how to arrange i can i can learn a new app on my smartphone in a matter of minutes uh, i can pick up a new object i've never seen before hold in my hand a few times and say i know what it feels like and what it looks like we run very rapidly and it's an efficient organ. Uh, the entire brain is about 20 watts. And this is uh, the spider maybe because it, everything in it is very slow. The, the fastest a neuron can do anything is about five milliseconds. So it has these very slow elements yet and uses very low power and yet it has these tremendous capabilities. Perhaps the most important thing in my mind about the neocortex is its extreme flexibility. Uh, we can learn, every one of us learns thousands of diverse tasks. Uh, we're just, it, it takes a while to realize how many things you know about the world and how things work, but everywhere from like how to take a t-shirt out of a drawer and put it over your head to how to, you know, turn pages in the book, how to cook, how to open doors, how to drive cars, how to type, how to program, um, just, you know, how to trim a tree and so on. We just we constantly learn a task. We learn new ones. And when we learn new ones, we don't forget the old ones. It should be obvious. Uh, but it's worth stating again that today's artificial intelligence is not as capable as the human brain, not even close. We're not close on even the capabilities or on these attributes. We're, we're just miles away from where uh, the human brain is today. 
Uh, so the outline of my talk is uh, I'm going to I'm going to tell you what we learned about the neocortex, and we think we have a good, a pretty good understanding of what's going on here. Uh, I'm going to start, start off by talking about how the neocortex learns a model of the world. That's what it does. It's a it's a model building system. Um, then I'm going to talk about how it's a highly distributed model, and and that it's divided into cortical columns of 150,000. And each of those cortical columns is a complete sensory motor modeling system. So it's a distributed system. Um, and then the tree, the key, the trick, if you will, to understanding how cortical columns work is reference frame. That goes back to the title of my talk. The cortical columns use reference frames for everything. They use reference frames to store knowledge and generate behaviors and to think and so on. That's the key to understanding how this whole thing works. And uh, finally, I'm going to end up talking about reference frames. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how neurons could do this, but we know that they can because it's from parts of uh, the old brain where we have things called grid cells and place cells, which implement reference frames. And what we believe is happening is the neocortex is using reference frames that are derivatives of the mechanisms that were evolved long ago to do something else. So that's the outline of my talk. Let's jump into it. Um, the neocortex learns a model of the world. That's the way to think about it. Uh, it's tempting to think of like, oh, it gets some input, it processes and does some output, but that's not the right way. What it does is it, it constantly learning a model of the world. And from that model of the world, then you can later act uh, as appropriate. The model of the world in your head is huge. It's hard to imagine how many things you know about the world. But let me just give you an attempt to sort of give you a sense of it. We know thousands of physical objects, how they look, how they feel, how they sound. Uh, we, we know that objects are composed of other objects. So take something like a bicycle. A bicycle isn't just a list of components. It's got wheels, it's got a frame, it's got... Um, it's got handlebars and chains and so on. These are all, each of these is objects that have their own sub-objects. So a wheel has a spoke and spokes and a rim and a tire and so on. So that's the way the world is. The world is composed of objects or themselves composed of other objects. But what's important is not just as a list of objects, but where they are located relative to each other. So if I walk into a room and I see the furniture, I'm remembering where the furniture is in the room relative to each other in relative to the room. When I think about a bicycle, a bicycle is not just a bunch of components. It's wheels that are in relationship to a frame, which are relationship to the seat and the handlebars and so on. The next thing is that um, things in the world are not static. And so we say objects have behaviors. Uh, so everything, almost everything you can deal with has some sort of behaviors they, as we interact with them or they behave on their own. So let's go back to our bicycle example. You know, a bicycle is not just a, a set of components relative to each other, but they have behaviors. The wheels turn, but they turn rel relative to the, to the chain and the, and the crank. I, when I grab my handlebars and I, and I squeeze the brake pedals, that causes certain actions. You have to learn how all these behaviors occur and what, what happens when we typically interact with them. If I, if I look at the, my cell phone, I remember where the, uh, the apps are. I remember how they, uh, they, uh, they operate. I know what I how to accomplish things. If I touch one icon, what happens? If I click down the menu, what happens? And so on. So the, everything we deal with in the world is like this. And, um, and our model of the world is, is not just for physical things, the things we can touch, like cell phones and, and bicycles. But we have models of things that are very difficult to, to say what exactly the model looks like, such as math and democracy. But we know we have some kind of model of these things because we can act upon them. We can think about them. We can reason about them. We can manipulate concepts in these spaces. So the, the, the model in your brain is not just about the physical things in the world, but it's about conceptual things as well. And it's huge. The point of having a model is that it allows you to create goal-oriented behaviors. So if I know how the world typically behaves, and I'm saying I'm in some state, and typically when I do this, this happens, or typically I do that, that happens. Or if I want to get from one location to another, what are the, what are the steps I might take to get there? So the model in head allows us to think about possible futures and to plan actions. And to say, okay, how am I going to accomplish certain things that I want to accomplish? And this is the value of having uh, a neocortex. Finally, the model uh, in the neocortex is predictive. And what we mean by this is that it's constantly, always, predicting what's going to happen next. We do this at low-level inputs, such as, like, when I touch something, what will I feel? If I turn my head to look to the left versus right, what will I see? Uh, I have expectations of what I'm going to hear when I do certain things. Uh, but it's also true high-level concepts. Um, so for example, if I were to um, just walk into a room and I see an, an analog clock on the wall, if, if I, if I, all of a sudden, if, if, I, if the hands on that clock were the same size, the, the minute hand and the hour hand were the same size, I would immediately say something's wrong here. And the only way you can, we know that, that something's wrong is your brain is making predictions. And so um, 
this is this is the constant thing here. When I pick up something, if it doesn't feel right, I notice it. If it doesn't sound right, I notice it. If it doesn't look right, I notice it. So the brain is constantly making these low-level predictions about what it's going to see, hear, and feel, and high-level predictions like the clock. And we may not be aware of these predictions, but we know they're occurring because if something is different, we notice it. The point of how, why does the cortex make predictions? It is the training system. It tells the cortex when it needs to update its model of the world, that something is wrong. It says, I thought it was going to be like this, but it wasn't like this. Therefore, our attention is drawn to the misprediction and we update the model of the world related to that. That's the whole point of having predictions in the, uh, in the cortex. Now, let's just flip over and say, what does the cortex look like? And uh, what's going on inside of it? If you uh, were to take the cortex out and you look under the microscope, you wouldn't see a picture like this. This picture shows the conceptual idea of, a, of seeing a, a slice of the neocortex there on, on the upper part of this image, and you see these columns. Um, so in this picture, these columns are about a millimeter. Uh, you can think about a millimeter in, in diameter. And um, in this case, if we had a neocortex, it would be about 150,000 columns. Columns really exist, they, and I'll tell you why in a second, but you wouldn't see them like they're not visible under a microscope, but we know they exist. And the reason we know they exist is for some experiments like shown below uh, from Mount Kessel in 1997. Here's a simple illustration of what a column is. In this case, there are six columns shown in the upper part of this line drawing. And they would stick a probe that went across, diagonally across the near cortex. It's, it went su successfully through these six columns. And the columns are, each column is associated with a sensory patch. In this case, a sensory patch on the skin. So what happened is they would see what the cells respond to, and all the cells respond to the same sensory patch for a little bit of a while, for about a millimeter. But then they abruptly jump to responding to a different sensory patch. And then they do that for a while, and they abruptly jump to a different sensory patch. It is this, it's this grouping by sensory input, which defines a column, not some physical structure. Um, but we know that this basic architecture exists throughout the neocortex. Now, actual columns in brains vary from anywhere from a little bit less than a millimeter, half a millimeter to about a millimeter. But we're just going to say for now that each column is about a millimeter in area, and therefore we would have about 150,000 columns in a human neocortex. When people look at the detailed architecture, uh, what's going on inside the neocortex, and specifically what's going on in each cortical column, um, they discover there's a very intricate uh, architecture in there. Those, this goes back a long way. These images are from Cajal starting back in 1899 when people were first able to see the architecture of the neocortex. Uh, the image on the left here, this is again a slice through the two and a half millimeters of the cortex. The image on the left here shows the cell body, the neuron body. And you can see that there are different sizes and densities. And when people look at it this way, they say, oh, look, there's these layers of cells. And so there's this, these cells of different types and different densities, different connectivities are layered in there. But when they looked at the connectivity between the neurons, which is in the right-hand image here, they saw that most of the connections were vertical. So when information arises into a cortical column, it mostly gets processed up and down between the layers, and then only later does it go someplace else. So it's so the processing is sort of isolated within, largely isolated within the column. Uh, over the last 120 years, there have been thousands of papers on the details of the architecture of the neocortex, and we're not going to review them here. But people like ourselves, theorists, we make diagrams like this, where we show different cell types and different layers and the different types of connections between them and which are they bidirectional or single unidirectional and so on. And we use these as constraints to understand our theories, like because if any theory has, has to match the anatomy that we see there. Um, I can't review all the details about the neocortex. It's very complicated, but I'm gonna make three high level observations. One is that columns are complex. Under a square millimeter, there's about 100,000 neurons, maybe 500 million synapses. There are dozens of cell types. Uh, they're organized in very prototypical complex circuits that, you, that say, yes, these cell types connect to these and these in some different ways. There's also a sub um, organization called mini columns, which I won't talk about earlier, but I'm talking right now about the larger columns. But each larger column has several hundred mini columns. So the thing we can conclude from this first observation is that whatever columns do is also complex. It is sometimes um, common for people to say, oh, a column is just doing some sort of feature extraction. You have some input, it's detecting some feature, and it's passing that on. Well, it only takes a few neurons to do feature extraction. And, co and columns are extremely complex. And most of the cells have been totally, they haven't been able to figure out what they do at all. So we can be certain that whatever col a, a column does, it's also going to be a complex function. The second surprising observation was um, that all columns, no matter where they appear, no matter what they're doing, um, they have a motor output. That they have cells that project someplace else in the brain that creates behaviors. So in the parts of the neocortex get input from the eyes and the retina, they project back to the part of the old brain that moves the eye. 
and the parts of the cortex that get input from the ears project back to the old brain that moves the head and the neck. And when you move your head, you change what you hear in the same way as when you move your eyes, you change what you see. This is, as far as we know, occurs everywhere in the neocortex. And so every column is a sensory motor or has some, some sort of motor output, but there's sort of a sensory motor processing element. And then finally, um, the columns are remarkably dissimilar. No matter where you look across the human neocortex, and even across different mammal species, there's a tremendous amount of the circuitry which is preserved in everywhere you go. Uh, there are differences between columns, and, we, and they're very well known, but the differences are relatively small compared to the commonality. It's as if every column everywhere in the neocortex across all mammal species is sort of doing the same basic thing with maybe a few tweaks here and there, which is really hard to imagine how that could be. But Malk, Raymond Malkhouse, again, in 1979, he wrote this famous monograph um, in which he made the following argument. He said, look, the columns look similar because they perform the same intrinsic function. In some sense, they're doing, all doing the same thing. But why, what a column looks like it's doing is determined by what it's connected to. So if you take a column and you connect it to a patch of the retina, you get vision. If you take a column and you connect it to the patch of the, uh, the cochlea, you get hearing. If you touch it to a patch of the skin, you get a touch. And if you take the outputs of columns and feed them into another column, you get high level concepts such as lingering. So what a column does is determined by what it's connected to. And then he makes it sort of the understated claim that um, understanding what a column does will have great generalizing significance. Meaning if we can figure out what a single column does, we're really going to get core at what it means to be intelligent. And because uh, this thing is repeated everywhere. People have been have known about this hypothesis for a very long time, but it's been very difficult to understand what it might do, what might a column might be doing. And that's our discovery. We kind of figured out the trick to understanding what a column does. Now, at this point, I'm just going to share with you a thought experiment. So you just have to listen along with me. Um, this is an experiment that actually happened, and um, it really led to the, uh, to the the theory I'm about to tell you. I was holding a coffee cup in my hand one day in my office, and I was touching the coffee cup with my finger, and I, and I asked myself, I said, well, if I move my finger up, I'll touch the rim of the cup, and if I move my finger to the right, I'll touch the handle of the cup. And I knew that if I move my finger, I, my brain would predict what it was going to feel. I can even imagine. I can say, oh, yeah, I move my finger. I can imagine what I would feel. I feel the roundness of the edge. Or I move it down. I open to the side. I feel the curvature of the, the handle. If I move to the bottom of the cup, I can feel the rough edge of the uh, unglazed bottom. So I said to myself, well, what does the cortex need to know to make that prediction? What does it need to know to predict what it's going to feel when I move my finger? And the answer was quite simple. The answer is the cortex needs to know two things. It needs to know what object it's touching, in this case, the coffee cup and say, oh, yeah, I know this object. And the second thing it needed to know, it needed to know where my finger was relative to the cup. That is, where would my finger be after it starts moving? And, and the key here is that it had to know where the finger is relative to the cup. It doesn't matter if the cup is to my side or in front of me. It doesn't matter if the cup is tilted left or tilted right or straight up. None of that matters. What matters is the position of my finger relative to the cup. And this is a, it's a strange concept, but this tells us that neocortex has, must have a, to know that location, it must have a reference frame relative to the cup. And if you're not familiar with the reference frame, you can think of it like a, a three-dimensional wire or grid, like an XYZ coordinates. It's attached to the cup. It moves with the cup. And therefore, the cortex says, where is my finger relative to that reference frame, therefore relative to the cup? We didn't know how this could happen, but we knew it must be happening. It's a simple thought experiment proves it has to be happening. So we, uh, we then realized um, that we could, uh, that this, this led to a different way of thinking about the neocortex overall. First of all, it made us realize that a single column now could learn the sort of shape or morphology or model of a complete object through movement. That is, as a finger moves over the cup, it's sensing different things, but it knows what location those senses are. Well, it's a cup, and therefore it can build up a model of a cup of like, what are the sensations at different locations on the cup? And so a single column can learn complete models of objects by integrating features and locations over time. So you can, you, by moving your finger, you can learn what a cup feels like, if you will, what its morphology is. So oh, in that paper, uh, we wrote this paper in 2017, which described this um, theory. We also proposed something else that's going on. Oh, I should mention here, I forgot that. Um, what we propose is in each cortical column here in the figure on the left, that not only were there sense features coming in, but there had to be in the lower layers of the cortex, a reference frame, which is specifying the location. And for that blue arrow is the way you can sense sensory feet, uh, associate sensory features with locations and reference frames. Similarly, we had to, we, we knew that the cortex needed to form a stable representation of the object, as in this case, the coffee cup. So with the representation of the object and the reference, representation of the reference frame, the location, then the, the column could learn a complete model of the object. Then we went on to show how 
columns can collaborate. So for example, if I were to ask you to reach into a black box and touch something and ask you what it is, you'd have you probably have to move your finger a bit to, wrap, to figure out what that object is. But if you reach with your whole hand, you often you can just get it right away that is with less movement. And so we knew that columns had to coordinate with each other. And we also knew that if, in this case, three fingers were touching the cup, they would be at different locations. Each finger is, could be at a different location on the cup. Each finger has to make its own prediction. So there are different locations and different predictions, but that but they all could vote on whether they're, uh, uh, you know, what objects they think they might be touching. So they, we, pr we propose that some of these long range connections in the neocortex that go between columns, most of those are there for voting. It's a way of columns to say like, I'm not sure what I'm touching, I'm not sure what I'm touching, but together we can all decide what's the one thing that's common that they can touch. And so this allows you to grab something with one hand and say, oh, I know what it is. But if you touch something with a single finger, you might have to move it several times before you recognize what it is. The same thing goes on in vision, perhaps a little bit less obvious, but each patch of retina uh, on the back of your eyeball is like a finger on your hand. Each one is looking at a small part of the world. And each one is gonna independently, the cortex, the representative retina, each column in the visual cortex is gonna say, where is that patch of sensory input relative to the object I'm looking at? So if you were to look at the world through a straw, it would be like looking, touching an object with a single finger. You'd have to move the straw around to see what, what it is you're looking at. But if you open up your eyes and see with your entire retina or your entire eye, then you can almost always get what it is with a single glance, just like you can grab with a, with a cup. So we believe this basic concept is occurring everywhere in the neocortex. The next question we had to answer is, how could neurons do this? How could neuron, neuron um, create a reference frame that's attached to an object? This is a very complex thing to do. And it, it's not at all obvious how neurons would go about creating these reference frames that are attached to objects and move with them and, and figure out locations. Fortunately, there's an existing proof that the brain can do this. In, in an older part of the brain called the hippocampal complex, there are these two organs called the hippocampus and the antirrhinal cortex. They're shown here in a human and a rat colored organs. In a human, they're about the size of a finger. Uh, they're in the inside of your brain and kind of curved like um, wrapping around the center of the brain. And what we now know uh, through the work done by some very creative scientists um, that this organ, these two organs, create a, sort of a reference frame uh, for locations of uh, environments in the world. So when you are standing in a room, you know where you are, and you walk around, you feel like you're in a different location in the room. These cells are doing that. And we know this by studying rats primarily, but we know that humans are doing it too. So these two uh, cell types of, that are found in these regions, there's grid cells in the antirrhinal cortex. Um, and these, are, you can think of these as creating a reference frame for environments, like a room or a building or something, some place you're in. And the place cells, which are well, place cells in the hippocampus, these are more sensory-driven representations of location. So they, these uh, these represent where you are, but based on what you're sensing, what you're seeing, in some sense. Um, and together, these two uh, organs work together to build models of the environments that we walk around and move in, or rats do it as well. So our hypothesis was the following that evolution discovered these structures for modeling, first modeling environments, like a room or you know, a pathway that you might be in, but then re, re took the same basic mechanism, which is a reference frame, and applied it to the neural neocortex. So we argued that there's grid cell and place cell equivalents exist in every cortical column, um, and they create reference frames for other things, not just environments, but for physical objects like bicycles and, and cell phones, and, and even concepts I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we published this theory in a, a series of papers you can see here on the right. Um, but here's a cartoon drawing to help you understand it. On the left, we show a rat moving around in a, in a box or an environment. And um, the rat knows where it's in that environment. Even if the lights are off in the dark, it has a good sense of where it is in that environment, just like you would in the dark and have like a sense where you are. Um, and, but as the rat moves around, I'm, I've labeled three locations here, D, E, and F. And grid cells would encode those locations. So whenever there's a set of grid cells and they would have a certain activation pattern when the cells in D and a different activation cell when the a pattern when they're in location E and a different activation pattern when they're in location F. And it doesn't really matter the direction that that rat moved or how it got there, but whenever it's in the location D, the same cells are active. When it's in location E, those cells are active and so on. Basically what's going on in the right here side, we're saying the same thing is going on, but when you're moving your finger over the coffee cup, it's just like the rat moving in the room, but now you're moving over this structure, this three-dimensional structure of a coffee cup. So I've labeled three positions there, X, Y, and Z. But it's basically the same thing going on. We're not, we're not moving the whole body, we're moving a sensory patch, which is our finger, and we're moving it relative to an object, not to a room. That's the basic idea. We have proposed 
that, um, that in each cortical column, in the lower layers, there are equivalent to grid cells. We'll call them just here uh, cortical grid cells, which represent the location in a reference frame of the object being sensed. And the upper layers, which are getting sensory input, have a sort of equivalent of place cells, which are sense features. Um, and so this very matches uh, very nicely with the sort of rough overall structure that we see in the hippocampal complex. Um, I'm not trying to say specifically what layers are being used here, but it's basically the upper layers and the lower layers. The blue line in between represents how we associate um, sense features with the locations. And that's essentially the modeling system uh, that we've talked about. This theory um, about every cortical column being a complete sensory motor system leads to a different way of thinking about hierarchy in the brain. So most everyone at this conference is aware of hierarchy. Here's how it's simply thought of. On the left, so all the way on the left here, you see um, sort of a very simple uh, flow chart like hierarchy, where you have the retina, which uh, I mean, the eyeballs we have with the retina, and the retina projects to the first cortical region for processing vision, which is V1. And V1 would extract some sort of simple features like edges. Then that projects to V2, which extracts more complex features. And you do this two or three more times and you get to regions that represent complete objects. This line of thinking has been underlying almost all deep learning networks, although there they use hundreds of layers of cells as opposed to three or four, um, but the same basic idea. But if you actually look at how the neocortex is, is organized, it doesn't look like this at all, actually. Um, this is a famous uh, picture from Solomon Vanessen, where they first started mapping out how regions in the, in the visual cortex uh, and then other parts of the monkey's brain are connected together. And this drawing the little rectangles of cortical regions and the lines are representing how they're bidirectionally connected. Uh, we, the details aren't important here, but we can point out a few things. Um, first of all, most of the connections in the neocortex are not hierarchical at all. They don't fit in any hierarchical scheme. They kind of go all over the place. Um, some are hierarchical, but most are not. Uh, more than 40% of all possible connections exist, and there, and there are dozens of hundreds of these regions. So this is not a, this is a very highly connect, connected, connected network. Another comes some strange things is the primary and secondary layer regions, the regions that are closest to the retina, the regions closest to the ear and the, and the skin. Um, they are the largest regions in the neocortex, which is odd if you're thinking you're extracting simple features, why would you have the biggest region in the neocortex extracting simple features? Well, the object areas supposedly recognizing complete objects are relatively small. In fact, in some animals like the mouse, it gets much worse. In the mouse, V1 is practically the entire visual system and there's no hierarchy at all. Um, and yet the mouse sees pretty well. Um, the next thing is that the primary sensory regions, you think, okay, this is V1, it's getting input from the eyes, but they exhibit multimodal responses. So we know now you know, that cells in V1 also respond to um, sensory input in the auditory region or sensory in some other sensory region which doesn't make any sense at all in the hierarchy model. Um, so we have proposed a different way of thinking about this. Uh, now think again, remember the cortex is filled with these columns and each column is learning a complete models, complete models of things. And so the way to think of it is we call this the thousand brains theory of intelligence. If I ask myself, well, where is a model of the coffee cup stored in the brain? It's not in one location. It's actually in thousands of columns, not all the columns, it's a small subset of the columns, but still thousands of columns. And so there'll be multiple, um, models of the coffee cup in the visual regions. There'll be multiple models of the coffee cup in the somatic sensory regions. Um, the visual regions are basically learning what coffee cups look like. The, the somatic sensory regions attached to the skin and they learn what coffee cups feel like. These models are complementary. They can't all learn all features. You know, they, they have different things they can look at and different models they build. And then most of the connections in the brain are, and we're shown here in blue, just a, a, car, a cartoon connection there. These are for voting. And what we believe is going on is that the columns are, each column is trying to guess what it's, do, what it's sensing. Like, what am I sensing right now? But there's often a lot of ambiguity. And so again, there's these voting neurons I mentioned earlier. And, and these are going all over the place. All these columns are trying to reach a consensus. Now it's interesting, we're generally only aware of the, uh, perceptually aware, consciously aware of the, the voting neurons. Um, that for example, your eyes are constantly moving about in the world and you don't normally are aware of that. You just don't know that your eyes are moving and the input to your brain are changing all the time. The world seems stable to you. So and that stability is the voting neurons. They're all saying, yeah, it's the same thing. I know we're moving all over the place. My fingers are moving, my eyes are moving. It's the same world out there right now. It's not moving. Um, and that's what we perceive. We don't perceive all the lack of the changes and what's going on. There are still hierarchical connections in this model. We're not saying there is no hierarchy. It's just that most of the connections are not hierarchical. Um, but the way to think about the hierarchy connections now, we're not passing features between regions, we're passing complete objects. And so you could 
this is where we're getting back to that object composition, objects composed of other objects. It's not like an object like a coffee cup is composed of features. An object like a coffee cup is composed of other objects, which are then composed of other objects and so on. Is there any empirical evidence for this? There is growing. There's not a lot, but there's, there's some very important growing empirical evidence for um, that this is actually what's going on in the neocortex. I'm just going to show you this one, um, I'm talking about these one set of experiments, uh, and I won't be able to go into the details on them because they're quite complex, but the basic lesson from them is pretty straightforward. Um, this is based on um, experimental technique that was developed in 2010 by Dollar, Barry, and Burgess. But these results here are from a, um, a lab that was using these experimental uh, techniques uh, by Constantinescu, O'Reilly, and uh, Barons. Uh, what they did is they took humans and they put humans in an fMRI machine, which measures blood flow in the brain. And the humans were looking at pictures of birds and the birds changed only by the size of their necks and the length of their necks and the length of their feet. So you can see these different types of birds. Um, and the humans were asked to do various sort of cognitive tasks related to these, like predicting what Kind of bird would appear next and organizing and things like that. And what they were able to show in a very clever way is that the way the humans organized knowledge of birds was using grid cells and reference frames built on grid cells. Um, this was uh, uh, perhaps surprising, but it's also consistent with our theory. Uh, but it's a really beautiful result that says even something conceptual like this, um, you know, when you think like, what does birds have to do with reference frames? That's how the brain is organizing this information. Um, and um, uh, we're just saying, what we're saying is this happens in every cortical column, not just uh, these columns that were in the prefrontal cortex. So a summary of my talk, um, I'm arguing that biological intelligence requires learning a model of the world. To be a human, to be an intelligent human, you have to learn a model of the world. And that model is based on is a, is a, a distributed model where each cortical column is a complete sensory motor modeling system and the columns vote to reach a consensus. Uh, columns use reference frame to do this. They use reference frames to represent knowledge. Everything we know is stored at locations in reference frames. Um, so whether that knowledge is about what constitutes an object, knowledge about our own body, or even knowledge about concepts. We believe that knowledge about concepts are stored in reference frames. And that when you actually think what you're doing is moving to reference frames in the same way as your finger is moving over an object. Um, I believe that machine intelligence must work on the same principles. I, I'm not going to make a, a very strong, you know, complex argument here. It's almost obvious to me uh, that if we're going to have an intelligent system, an intelligent machine, an artificial, a truly intelligent artificial intelligence, it needs to have a model of the world. It needs to understand how the world works. It has to have knowledge about the world. And the only way you can organize knowledge is using reference frames. We don't necessarily have to do it the same way the brain does, but this distributed model using reference frames, I think, is essential. And you can't separate out the motor behavior as well. So any AI that doesn't have an integral motor behavior is just not going to get there. At our company, Nementa, we have created a roadmap um, uh, how to get from where we are today to where we think machine intelligence or AI has to be. And this is a very sort of simplified version of this roadmap. But on the left here, we, we see uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, which are layered neural networks and they are highly connected and they're, and they're fully activated. I mean, every neuron connects every neuron layer to layer and all the neurons are active to some sense. Uh, part of our theories is based on a very deep understanding of sparsity. Everything I talked about here requires that in the brain, the neurons are sparsely activated and the connections between them are sparse. So we've developed a theory of sparsity and we've already been able to show um, that by going to the sparse networks, we get some really desirable attributes. I'll come back to that in a second. So that's the first step we're going to. The next step, we also, I didn't talk about this, but we have developed a theory about why neurons have dendrites and why they're active dendrites. This is also something that's essential for the whole system to work. So we've, that's on our roadmap as well. The active dendrites are basically gonna replace the point neuron that most artificial neural networks use today. Um, but this allows, among other things, continuous learning. It allows you to learn new things without forgetting old things. Then of course, we have the next column over, we have to implement the reference frame concept. Uh, and now this gets to true invariant representations and fast learning. And ultimately we want to get to the entire neocortical model uh, where you have these complex columns that are voting. And once you have built that in silicon or built that in software, it's then creating very intelligent machines as a matter of replication and embodiment. Just, um, I say today, but when I gave this talk a few weeks ago, uh, we, it was uh, on a Tuesday, I believe. And at that day we released a white paper um, and a press release showing some very impressive results we had gotten uh, taking existing uh, convolutional neural networks. And by applying sparsity to them, we were able to show 
that we could gain gains uh, over 50 times uh, performance improvement with competitive accuracy, you know, without losing any accuracy. Um, and so uh, that was a pretty major accomplishment from our point, I think. And I think it's going to make a huge difference in um, many neural networks, um, which today are consuming huge amounts of power. Um, if you want to learn more about this, we have a whole series of papers. Uh, these are primarily neuroscience papers that talk about the theory. I've listed them here. You can find them on our website. If you're not used to reading neuroscience papers, I admit it can be hard to read. Uh, so uh, just be a caveat about that. We had a poster uh, at this conference called Sparsity in, your, in the Neocortex and its Implications for Machine Learning. Um, and uh, that poster is also going to be posted on our website. And you can contact either uh, me or Subhita Ahmad, who's, who's giving that poster session, um, if you have questions about it. Um, and finally, uh, I, I have a new book coming out called A Thousand Brains, which details this theory. Um, the first part of the book talks about the neuroscience component of this. Uh, the second part is all about AI and how I believe the brain theory, and specifically the, the, the thousand brain theory, is going to impact the future of AI. And the third part of the book, I'll leave it to you to discover to the more philosophical view of life. Uh, okay, and with that, I'm done. Thank you for listening. And again, you can go to our website where we have all kinds of information about all of this stuff. That's it.